Let's talk about the energetics of walking. That is, kinetic energy, potential energy, and how they are exchanged during walking to make it efficient. Energy is really important, and it's kind of amazing what we could do. Maybe a, a quick cup of tea and a piece of toast in the morning, and you can walk an incredible distance. That's because we're very energy efficient. We are made to move a long distance on very little energy. And in today's lecture, you'll see exactly why that's possible. So our agenda is pretty straightforward. We'll talk about the energetics of walking, and we'll talk about simple models of walking and how they understand energetics. We'll then move on to the contrast with running in the next lecture. That's the plan. So I said in last lecture that the ground reaction forces are critically important for understanding dynamics and energetics of walking. So what I'd like to start with now is how we actually compute kinetic energy and potential energy from these measurements of ground reaction force. So this is the engineering problem here. Using experimental forces from estimates, uh, form estimates, of mass center velocity and forward kinetic energy. So there are some key equations that we already know. The dynamic equations of motion in the vertical and horizontal directions, the sum of forces in the vertical direction is the mass times acceleration in the vertical direction. The sum of forces in the horizontal direction is the mass times acceleration in the horizontal direction and kinetic energy of a particle. Kinetic energy is one half mv squared. So the challenge is write an equation for the horizontal center of mass velocity and use that with our one half mv squared to write an equation for the kinetic energy. We'll do this, and what we'll see is that the kinetic energy varies over the gate cycle, and we're gaining kinetic energy from potential energy of the mass center. So let's go ahead and write the equations. So we want to get an estimate of the kinetic energy of the mass center from measurements of ground reaction force. So here's a depiction of the mass center. We've collapsed the whole body into a point mass for now, and we have a ground reaction force in the y direction, the vertical direction, and a ground reaction force in the x direction, the horizontal direction. And we know that the sum of forces is going to be equal to the mass times acceleration, Newton's second law. And we also know that kinetic energy is one-half mass times the velocity of the mass center squared. Okay, well, let's, we have these measurements of ground reaction force. Let's form these quantities. So... Let's say we care about the horizontal ground reaction force. So the force in the ground in the x direction is equal to the total mass times the acceleration in the x direction. So because I've done these, these are now scalars, these are vectors up here. We have the measurement of this. We want to know the acceleration and velocity and position of the mass center that we can get because we now say the acceleration in the x direction is equal to 1 over the mass times the force in the ground in the x direction. Okay, so we have acceleration. Now we know that the velocity is the integral of acceleration, and the position is the double integral of acceleration. So we can say the velocity in the x direction I'll take 1 over mass outside of the integral because mass is constant, so we don't need to integrate it, times the integral of the acceleration in the x direction with respect to time. Okay, so we have velocity in the x direction. All we need to do for kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared. So we can write the kinetic energy is one half m, and then we have the v squared here. So here we have one over m 
integral of acceleration in the x direction with respect to time squared. Fantastic. We can get acceleration from the measurement of ground reaction force, and by simply integrating that, we can get an estimate of the horizontal kinetic energy. We could do exactly the same thing for horizontal kinetic energy, so I won't write out the equations. It's exactly the same. But we also want to know something about gravitational potential energy. To do that, the gravitational potential energy is going to be related to the height of the mass center from a certain, let's say, the floor. To get the position of the mass center, we integrate the acceleration twice. The first integral is the velocity of the mass center. The second integral is the position of the mass center. So we could go about the same process for the mass center, but integrating the vertical ground reaction force twice. One to get the velocity of the mass center, and the second to get the position of the mass center. So with that, we could derive the gravitational potential energy. And I'll leave it to you to go ahead and do that. That problem is solved in the Biomechanics of Movement textbook, and you can, you can see the solution to that equation there. Okay, so now that we've derived those, we can examine the kinetic poten and potential energy during walking. And that's what I'm plotting here in the video. So the red curve is the gravitational potential energy. So what she has is she has a marker on her hip that's moving up and down as you go through the gait cycle. And as that goes up and down, the gravitational potential energy fluctuates. The gravitational potential energy is the mass times gravity times the height, mgh is the potential energy. And that's just fluctuating up and down. What you see plotted here is on the blue curve, the forward kinetic energy that we just computed. And what's so interesting about this in walking is that they are out of phase. When one's high, the other's low. When the other one's low, the other one's high. So you see those fluctuating up and down in opposite. So when forward speed, when forward kinetic energy is a maximum, the mass center is its lowest during walking. So that's very interesting. Why is that interesting? Because we see that during walking, we are so efficient because we are trading gravitational potential energy for forward speed. Essentially, we are falling and then catching ourselves from falling. So we get a little bit of energy from our mass center coming down, and then we go back up to the next gait cycle. So if I plot the energy of the mass center versus percentage of gait cycle, you can see, now these are from real uh, measurements on humans, you can see the forward kinetic energy in orange here peaks at the same time that the gravitational potential energy reaches its minimum. So these two are out of phase. What other kinds of systems have gravitational potential energy and, and kinetic energy that are out of phase. One simple one is shown here. If you just take a ball rolling up and down a hill, at the top of the hill, the potential energy is the highest, and it's going its slowest. At the bottom of the hill, you go down the hill, you recapture that gravitational potential energy. The forward speed, the V, velocity, is the highest, and so we have the highest kinetic energy at the bottom of the hill. And back up the hill, you lose speed, you're trading kinetic energy for potential energy, and then back down the hill. So that just keeps going. That's exactly what's happening in walking. Now, in a perfect system, it takes no energy to keep this going. Of course, there are, in real systems, losses from friction and other physical forces, but it's an incredibly efficient system. So a ball rolling up and down a hill is one system in which gravitational potential energy and forward kinetic energy are traded. But there are others. A pendulum, for example. A pendulum swinging does the same thing. So here, we have zero velocity, so zero kinetic energy. And down at the bottom, we have the highest velocity, lowest potential energy, and that just keeps trading. So a pendulum is another system like this. What we'll see in walking is that we can model walking as an inverted pendulum. 
So we get the same trade-off with an inverted pendulum. And I'll show you that here. So a professor at Harvard named Tom McMahon uh, wrote a beautiful book about biomechanics and was a real inspiration to me, came up with this model that he called the ballistic walking model that influenced the importance, that, that highlighted the influence of gravity in walking. So the ballistic walking model was formed of an inverted pendulum for the stance leg and a compound pendulum, that is two pendula, for the swing leg. It emphasizes the importance of gravity, especially uh, during the swing phase. So let's break down the ballistic walking model uh, in a little bit more detail. So the stance limb is modeled as an inverted pendulum. So here's your non-foot, here's your stance limb. We don't have a knee, we don't have a torso, we don't have an arm or heads. We're just modeling the, the mass center and an inverted pendulum. So the stance limb is fixed and fully extended and rotating over the ground with a pin joint. Now we add to that the swing leg. The swing leg is modeled, the swing limb is modeled as a double pendulum. So up here you can see it's attached at the hip. Here's the thigh, here's the shank. We're ignoring the foot and we're just modeling this as a double pendulum. One of the things that McMahon noticed is that given the right initial conditions for a swing phase, the right positions and velocities of the body segments, you can get a swing phase with no energy, no muscles, no anything, and you clear the leg over the ground and it produces a nice swing phase that looks much like very slow walking. So this ballistic walking model uh, lived and was quite inspirational for many people. And you can see the combined here. So stance limb, swing limb, and the combined ballistic walking model. So what features of gait does this model capture well? A key one is that it captures this fluctuation of kinetic energy and potential energy during the walking gait cycle. A big limit, it also captures the the swing phase of gait quite well, the dynamics of the limb during swing, at least for slow walking. But the model can't take steps. The ground reaction forces it produces are not very realistic, so there are some real limitations. Nonetheless, it was quite inspirational and it inspired a new generation of walking model. So, that's shown here. It's called the dynamic walking model. And it was introduced by Art Quo and Max Donilon in 2010. It was a positive next step. And I'll describe that in a little bit more detail. The ballistic walking model also inspired Tad McGear to build this machine, this robot that can walk. So this is spectacular because it will walk on its own just because it's built to walk. It has two legs. It can walk down a slight hill with no, no spinal cord, no nervous system, no control. Uh, it's just a beautiful, passive, dynamic walker. In 1990, Tad McGear was building these robots. And here's the video of the first time one of these walked. What you see is that it's walking down a tiled pattern uh, you can't really see that it's about a four degree downhill incline, but it does look a lot like walking. It turns out that if we are built to walk, we have two legs and walking down a slight incline uh, with a machine like that has legs, we'll walk. So this was a real breakthrough and started really a whole field of dynamic walking. So going from the ballistic walking model, which was quite a helpful analytical tool, but it can't actually walk. Its feet are anchored to the ground. In fact, it doesn't even have feet. And then the dynamic walking model as described by Quo and Donilon was the positive next step. The model addresses some of the limitations by enabling step-to-step -step transitions and it generates a repeated gait cycle like you saw in McGear's robot. 
So this dynamic walking model is extremely useful for analyzing human gait. What's coming up next is for us to study walking versus running. And this simple inverted pendulum model, which worked so well for walking, doesn't work so well for running. But an equally simple model of a mass just moving over a springy leg is quite helpful. So that's where we're headed next.